alloys are not in your book, first of all, or at least very little is mentioned in your book, but they're important in terms of talking about metal solids. So first we have to know what an alloy is. And an alloy is a mixture that contains more than one element. and has properties of a metal. So alloys are going to contain metal as at least part of the elements that are in it. Uh, the thing is is that there's a lot of pure metals and all those properties that make metals metals, like the fact that they're ductile and malleable and all of these things, can sometimes be detrimental for various uses. And so it's a way to mix things in that might modify the properties of the pure metal. So there's three types that you need to be aware of. And we'll kind of go through those a little bit. But before I do, I want to just show you a picture of two of the types that we'll talk about. There's a substitutional alloy, which of course is this first one here, and an interstitial alloy, which is the second. And if you stare at those pictures for a little bit, I think you're going to be able to see some of the differences between them. So with the substitutional alloy, you can see like this, for example, this might be the, the host metal atom, and that in between, it's actually replaced by some other atom in there. And that's what makes it a substitutional atom. Now, the uh, substitutional alloy. A couple of things that we need to know about this substitutional alloy is, first of all, both of these are homogeneous mixtures. So they're the same throughout. Wow, that didn't look like mixtures, did it? Let's fix it. <laughs> but one of the things that hopefully you can notice is as you look like at a small grouping, notice that the two radii are very similar. So this occurs between atoms of similar radii. That's why one is able to substitute for the other or replace another. The other thing is that whole electron C model still applies in both of these cases. And so it's still malleable still very ductile, all of those properties of metals, it still applies, it's just it has different metal atoms inside that are sliding around each other. And if we were to take a look at the density between them, the density is usually somewhere between the densities of the metals that make it up. Just write that down. All right, great. So that being said, what are some examples of substitutional alloys? So some examples of that would be brass. Brass is made up of about two-thirds copper and one-third zinc. So the zinc has replaced some of the copper atoms. So like in this case, you could think of the black ones as, as being the copper and the red ones as being the zinc, and that would be sort of an example of brass. Um, other ones, just so that you get an idea, sterling silver is also a substitutional alloy. It's about 92.5% silver and about 7.5% copper. And gold, I'm going to put that in quotes here, um, because gold is a substitutional alloy between gold and silver and copper. And when I say gold, I'm referring to the gold you may have in jewelry. So let me just show you with gold. Here's a little diagram of gold. Depending on the type of gold, we'll determine what kind of alloy it is. If you want white gold, there's actually a lot of silver in it and very little gold. But depending on the color, if you want yellow gold, you can see that it's going to, based on, you know, this is the weight percent of gold and copper, you know, yellow gold. Let's say if you're right in here is, you know, 20% silver and 80% gold. Um, there's also reddish gold, and, you know, that's going to be an alloy between gold and copper. And so not that this is something that you need to memorize or anything. That isn't the case. But I just want you to show, you know, gold by itself is so soft. It is so incredibly soft. 
that you never make jewelry out of pure gold. All pure, all gold is an alloy. If it's 18 karat gold or 24 karat gold, it has far more actual gold in it than something that's 10 karat gold. 10 karat gold has much less gold and it's uh, got an alloy of, depending on the type of gold, more silver and copper in it. But 10 karat gold is a much harder metal than 24 karat gold because the more pure gold you have in it, the softer it is. For jewelry that might change shapes like rings and stuff, not a great idea. All right, so that's substitutional alloy. Uh, another one then is number two, interstitial alloy. And what hopefully you can see is that we have the holes. There are actually holes, if you kind of take a look where I'm highlighting in here, in between the host metal atom, and there are atoms inside of that. So that's going to occur for interstitial alloy is going to occur when one atom has a much smaller radius than the other. Sometimes that smaller radius atom is even not a metal. In the case of steel, which I'll mention in a moment, it's carbon. So it doesn't have to be a metal, but overall it has the properties of a metal. Um, this is also a homogeneous mixture, as I mentioned before. It's very evenly distributed there. Um, but unlike the substitutional alloy, where we had mentioned up here it was still very malleable and ductile, these little atoms in there kind of prevent the other atoms from sliding as easily. And so as a result, an interstitial alloy is typically more rigid, less malleable, less ductile because those atoms are, it's harder for them to slide because there's really another atom in the way. Now density wise, unlike the other one where we said the density would be between, putting those little atoms in there does not appreciably change the volume. So since the lattice of those host atoms doesn't expand much, but you are adding additional atoms into the space, Typically, what we find in interstitial alloys is the overall density increases. Now, I mentioned as an example, steel. Steel is typically made, there's a variety of types of steel, but a, the, a very common steel is made up of iron and carbon. And iron has a much larger radius than carbon does. So in the example here, these would be iron, and the red ones in between would be carbon atoms. Because pure iron, it's really soft, malleable, ductile, and when you stick those carbon in it, it makes it harder and stronger and less ductile. Um, some things, however, could be, let's scroll down here, some things, like just as a kind of a, an example, like stainless steel, which is probably what your faucets at home are made of, is actually both substitutional, substitutional, yeah, <laughs> and interstitial, and that's not uncommon as well. A typical formula, so to speak, for iron, I'm sorry, for steel, is about 80.6% 80 iron, this is not the only recipe, so to speak, of this, 18% chromium, 1% nickel, and 0.4% carbon. And the reason I point that out to you is that these three have very similar radii. And so these three will tend to form a substitutional alloy where the chromiums and nickels replace some of the iron. But the carbon has a much smaller radius, and so it ends up fitting into the holes in between the others, forming an interstitial alloy. So we have substitutional interstitial. And the last one I'm going to mention, although not, I'm not going to mention much about it, is those other ones were homogeneous alloys. There is such a thing as a heterogeneous alloy. And really, I mean, you could take two molten metals, and if you, you know, have them melted, and then you mix them, and then you cool them ra really rapidly, they may not be evenly mixed. And you may have some parts that are a little different than others, and so as a result, you end up with a mixture of metals that when they re-solidify, 
are actually heterogeneous. But the important thing to understand with all of these alloys is it's no different than the electron C model that we saw. All of them have delocalized electrons, which is why alloys are able to have the properties of a metal. All right, we'll see you guys in class next time.